got nothing to do with the message, but it's got something to do with the Lord, amen. I like the Lord, don't you? His goodness, and the songs that have been sung today about His goodness, the good teaching about His goodness, boy, there ain't nothing like our God. Amen. Nobody loves you like God. His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. <laughs> Thank God Christ died for us. Romans chapter number 8, what a great uh, picture of God's love. I mean, some of the greatest verses in the Bible about the eternal security of the believer, and there's a bunch of them in there. But Romans chapter 8, let me get there, Romans 8. Look down to verse number 30. Look at verse 30. We'll start there. Romans 8, 30. Anybody got it? Amen. What's the first word there? Moreover. Moreover. Amen. Moreover. Who, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. Amen. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Amen. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, what, what shall we say, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm glad God's for me. Amen. Amen. He said in verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also Make an intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank God for God so loved the world. So much for losing what God did, amen. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number 11. We've been preaching a little bit about faith on uh, Sunday nights. We're having a baptism tonight, so I thought we'd be good to get in a little bit of faith this morning to continue what we've been dealing with on Sundays. Amen. Amen. We as God's people need faith in God. Amen. Thank God for the faith of salvation that the brother said this morning. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we as God's people are to operate by faith. Faith cometh by hearing Hearing by the word of God. And the word of God gives us faith to serve the Lord. And we've looked at these descriptions of faith in this chapter. The five descriptions of faith. The now faith. The through faith. The by faith. The without faith. And the dying in faith. And I want to look at an individual this morning called Moses. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11. In verse 23. By faith Moses. We said that by faith is a faith that pleases God. It's near, it's by, it's close to Him. And the closer we are to Him and the nearer we are to Him, the more we can please Him. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. What was the king's commandment at that time? That any male child that was born, he was to be killed. And Moses' parents, by faith, trusted the Lord and hid their child from the destruction that Pharaoh wanted to him. The Bible said in verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years. It goes from when he was a child to when he was a little bit uh, at age. Come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing... Rather, the suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. 
for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, just like his parents didn't. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible through faith. That's that faith that is a faith of promise, and God has promised to carry us through. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assayed to do were drowned. Let us pray. Brother Tim Sellers, how about pray for us, brother? Yes, God help us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Moses is a very interesting individual in the Bible. And when it speaks about the faith of Moses, the first of all I want you to see is in verse 23 is what I call perennial faith. It was the faith of his parents. You know, we need parents that have faith in God, that God can do the impossible, amen. It was perennial faith. By faith, they were not afraid. Amen. The Bible said by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Well, there's a lot of commandments that come by the world that will try to destroy our children, but we as God's children need to have faith in God for our children that God would do great things in their lives. There is the perennial faith of his parents, and God give us more parents with perennial faith. In verse 24, I see what I call personal faith. The perennial faith that was in his mother and father rolled over into personal faith in his own life. And if we as God's children and children of, uh, parents of our children would lay a foundation that can clearly be seen by our children. I know what happened to Moses and how he went down in that bull rush and Pharaoh's daughter took him in and had compassion to him and then laid him back into the lap of his own mother which nursed him up to a certain age and was given back to Pharaoh's daughter. Hey, but, but that faith when they put him in that bull rush for God to do what needs to be done with this child and sometimes we got to act the faith of God just to give our children to God. God I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to hold to I don't know if he'll make it far down the stream, but I'm going to get him into your hands and trust you to do what's best. Hey, we need some perennial faith for God to take care of our children. And in this case, it rolled into personal faith in his own life. And that always turns out that way. I know we're to train up our children the way they should go. When they're older, they won't depart from them. That faith, that instilling that we put in them cannot lead them. God has promised that, amen. Whether they do something with it or not, it is their choice. But it would be good for us to put that kind of faith in their life that God has some type of seed to raise up in their soul to get a hold of their hearts. It led over the personal faith of Moses. In verse 25, 4, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The, the perennial faith of his parents that were not afraid of the king's commandment uh, led the personal faith of Moses that gave him the right attitude, amen. And boy, we need an attitude adjustment sometimes. In the attitude of Moses, I see that he refused, in verse 24, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It was personal to him. He had to make a choice one day that, hey, it was either the treasures of Egypt or it was the way of God, and he chose the way of God. He refused the treasures of this old world, amen. And we need some children to come to years and say, I refuse to go the way of the world. Amen. He had the right attitude. It caused a refusal in his life, which led to verse 25, a choice that was made in his life, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. His personal fate had the right attitude. It refused the way of the world and it chose the way of God because verse 26, it esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. It's the right attitude that causes the refusal that makes the right choice that esteems the right things in his life. Amen. It went from perennial fate, the practical fate, Amen. Uh, excuse me, the personal faith, which what I say next is practical faith. 
this personal faith in his heart began to be practical in his life. Now, it's one thing to have a, a parents that have faith. It's one thing in our lives to get some personal faith, but it's another thing to make that what's personal practical in our lives. There's some people that have personal faith. They have testimony of salvation, that God has saved them, that God has been good to them. But as far as practical, you're not seeing it much in their lives. Hey, when it came to Moses here, his parents laid a foundation. He, he, he received the right attitude. It was personal to him, but one day it became practical to him. It was not just an attitude of refusal and choosing and esteeming. It was something that led forth in steps in his life to step out and trust God to do right things. It led from an attitude to actions, amen. It's practical in his life. If you will, it's kind of like James says, practically speaking, amen. It's no longer a dead faith, but it is a living faith. I know where that lines up doctrinally in that situation, but I'm talking about practically in our lives. A lot of God's people, his faith is dead. It's just lying dormant, and we need some alive faith that produces action from our lives, amen. amen. It's practical, amen. There was actions in his life. This personal faith becomes powerful faith when we act upon God's word. Amen. Look at, look at the way it's described here. It was the faith of his parents that, had the, uh, uh, the, that were not afraid of the king's commandment. It was the personal faith of his life that got the right attitude, and that right attitude caused a refusal. It caused a choice, and it caused an esteeming. These are attitudes of action, amen. Hey, hey it's a choice. It's esteem, and it's putting things in the right place. But it goes practical when you get to verse 25 when it says, verse 27, when it says, by faith he forsook. That's practical. It's one thing to make a choice. It's one thing to refuse. And it's another thing to esteem. But the Bible said he forsook. It was not just an attitude. Now it is an action. Amen. Hey, you can have the right attitude in your heart about God and the things of God. But there comes a time in your life where those attitudes means to be action in our life. He forsook Egypt. He just not one day said, hey, you know what? I esteem God's riches greater. And I make the choice for Christ. Amen. And I really refuse the way of the world. But I'm going to take that refusal attitude, that choice that I'm making of esteeming Christ. And I'm going to leave Egypt. I'm going to leave Pharaoh's power and I'm going to trust God to do great things in my life. Probably here this morning we have people that have the right attitude. Thank God for the right attitude. Man, we need the right attitude. The attitude that Christ is better and the things of God are wiser and making the right choice to serve the Lord will do better in your life. But when is that attitude going to become an action in your life when you leach forward, amen, and take a step and trust God to do great things with your life? It is practical faith. The personal becomes powerful, amen. He acted upon God's word. Look at the verse here, verse 27. For by faith he forsook. That's an action. The Bible said in verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover. That's an action, amen. In verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea. Here are the actions that are taking place. It's not only just personal, but now it's practical, amen. Hey, Moses had a faith that practiced what he believed, amen. He practiced what God laid on his heart, amen. But how can you practice your faith? Let me look at Moses this morning. Number one, I want you to see, when it comes to practical faith in your life, you got to keep the right focus. you got to have the right focus, amen. You know what's wrong with us? We're not focused. Amen. Our mind's here one day and there the next day, and I know how it works, and I know the mind is at enmity against God, and the flesh doesn't like the things of God, but there's something inside of us and the new birth and the new man and the new creation of God that desires the heavenly things, and we got to put forth that thing that God has showed us in action in our life, but we've got to keep focus on what's before us. Amen. Look in verse 27. How did he do it? By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's the focus. The focus is on the invisible, amen. You know what I see about him keeping, keeping focus? He, he believed what he could not see. That's faith, amen. I believe what I cannot see, amen. Hey, why? Because God has said it, amen. And if God has said it, it's going to come to pass. I believe this book. I never saw him die on the cross, but I believe he died, amen. I believe the unseen, the invisible, amen. And that's how Moses operated. He kept focus on the invisible, amen. amen. He believed what he could not see. 
Amen. We must believe what God shows us in our lives. Look in Romans chapter number 1. We lose our focus because we don't believe what God has showed us. Somebody said, never doubt in the darkness what God has showed you in the light. Amen. Do you know what God will do? God will reveal things to you. And God will show you things. Hey, God will come to you and convict you about salvation. And God will save your soul. God will reveal truths in your life and direction in your life and things God would have you to do. Hey, but when it gets hard, it gets dark, we begin to doubt what we saw in the light. The Bible said about Moses, you in Romans 1, listen to what he said in verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. When Moses stepped out by faith and done what he did and slew that Egyptian, and the world, and, and, and he, got, he got to thinking that uh, the Pharaoh's going to get knowledge of what he has done. Amen. I'm not saying it was right for him to kill the Egyptian. He was trying to take up for his people. It caused him to flee, amen, and run uh, for his life. Hey, but he kept his focus on God. He believed the invisible, amen. He trusted God even though he couldn't see it, that God was going to use him one day to do great things for the Lord, amen. You got to trust God. Hey, God laid something on your heart. I'm going to use you one day. I'm going to use your life. I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bless your marriage. I'm going to bless your testimony. Amen. Don't lose your focus. Amen. Hey, keep trusting what God showed you in the life. How many of God's people, amen, have been made commitments to the Lord and laid things on an altar and said, God, this is what I do, and then all hell breaks loose. And the storms come and Pharaoh's attacking and the world's just chopping down at your neck, amen. And the flesh is rising up saying, you're not worthy, you can't do that, amen. And, and, you, and you begin to doubt and the world's throwing it at you and the devil's throwing it at you and it's getting dark. you got to trust what God has showed you, amen. Yeah. Don't lose focus on what God has laid before you, amen. Moses' faith that was personal is becoming practical and it is practical because he kept his focus. Look in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by what? We don't live by sight, we live by faith. You know what sight to do? The sight of this world, the visible, will sometime destroy the invisible visions that God has given us. Where God has laid things on us from the word of God and spoken to our heart about things. You cannot lose focus on what God has given you. Look how he goes on to say in verse 18, speaking about that faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Isn't that clearly seen that God's wrath is on the wickedness of this world? You can see that. The Bible says in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. You know what God will do? He'll show you. He'll speak to you. He'll reveal things out of the word of God to you. And by, by the way, God will never reveal to you anything that's contrary to this book. If you say God has shown you something and it does not line up with the word of God, it was not God that revealed it to you. It might have been your little fleshly motives. It might have been something from the devil or something the world's trying to push on you. Hey, everything God does will line up with his book. Amen. Hey, God will show it unto you. Look at in verse 20, 20. He says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen. How, what did he show us? Being understood by the things that are made, even these eternal power in God, and so that they are without excuse. You know what the world says? Is there a God? Creation testifies there's a God. It's visible. God has shown us that this thing did not come from an explosion. It didn't come from some monkey or some cell in some mud puddle. It come from Almighty God, and God has shown it to us by creation. Amen. There is a God. And you got to keep your focus on what God has shown you. Amen. Because hey, God will reveal his will to your life. Moses stepped forth, not fearing the wrath of the king. He had to keep focus on the invisible. And God had showed him something and God was going to use him. You must believe what God shows you. You must keep your eyes on the eternal and not on the physical. Amen. Amen. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You know what we do? We put our eyes on the temporal. It's all about this world. You know what happens when you lose your focus on the eternal and get it on the temporal? Temporal means it won't last. You know how a lot of God's people lose their focus? Because they get their eyes on the temporal. Well, what about today? What about now? What about what I'm facing? What about God? 
faith is God, amen. And we lose our focus, amen, when we don't believe what God shows us and we get our eyes on the temporal instead of on the eternal. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How am I going to keep my focus? Verse 18, while we look not at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not, which are not seen are eternal. He moved as seeing him who was invisible. Amen. He believed what God showed him just as it was physically in his sight. Amen. Hey, hey it's, it, when, you, when God reveals something to you, it's just as much as you just, you can about touch it. Amen. But it's faith. Amen. You can't touch it. Amen. But I can believe what God said in that book, which is tangible to me, and it's real to me, and it's substance to my soul, and I can press forward for the Lord. You know what the devil's trying to do, amen, when it comes practical in your life? He wants you to lose your focus. Get your eyes on this world. Get your eyes on the glitter. Get your eyes on the glamour. Don't we need to get our eyes on glory, on the will of God, on what God has shown us, and step forward for the Lord, amen. His per personal faith has become practical. You've got to keep your focus. You know what focus is? A central point, a point of concentration. Focus. What is it on? There's so many distractions, aren't there? There's so much going out in this world to try to get our eyes off the Lord. It's about like Peter when he stepped out on the water to come to the Lord. When he kind of threw it out to the Lord and said, bid me come unto thee. Hey, you know, I don't really think there's nothing wrong with you kind of laying something for the Lord. Say, God, if it be your will, let me do it. When's the last time you ever laid, you, when's the last time you ever made any suggestion to the Lord? Isaiah said, here I am, send me. That's a suggestion, amen. You think, well, I can't suggest nothing to the Lord. I'm not fit for nothing. No, we're not fit for nothing in ourselves, but we're fit in him. Amen. It was Peter that said, hey, bid me come in the day. He made the suggestion. Amen. You say, well, that's why he sunk. I believe not. Amen. I, I believe that a lot of those guys that were sitting in the boat, amen, they wish they had went out there with him. Right. Amen. Hey, but a lot of people rather sit in the boat instead of make a suggestion. I want to be with the Lord. I want to be close to him, amen. Hey, the problem was when he stepped out, he lost his focus, amen. It was the winds and the waves that distracted him away from the central point, which was Christ, amen. When he stepped out on the word of God, it was God that said, come unto me. He stepped out by faith on God's word, but he got his focus altered, amen, by the world, and he began to sink, amen. But when he focused back on the Lord, say, Lord, save me, God lifted him up and brought him back into the boat. When it comes to practical faith in our life, we got to keep the focus on the central point, and the central point is God and his will. Yeah, what does God want to do with my life? Hey, when's the last time instead of seeking something in this world, you laid your life down on the altar and say, God, here it is, use me. It's practical. Amen. Moses had this personal faith which caused him to choose and to endure and to make right decisions, but it became practical when he stepped out. He trusted the Lord. He believed what he could see, amen. Hey, what did he see? He could see faith in what God has showed him, just as it was real. you got to keep your focus. How do you do that? Look in Hebrews chapter 11. Look, back to, look in chapter 12. You know the verse here. You must believe what God shows you. If you're going to be focused, you got to have your eyes on the eternal and not on the Temporal, but you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. He leaves chapter 11 of the descriptions of great individuals of faith. And he says in verse 12, look at the first word, wherefore. We've just seen all the descriptions of the great individuals. And you know God's still writing things down? The Bible says, wherefore, seeing also, seeing we also, are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Do you know what? If you wanted to practically, we can read chapter 11 and we are witnesses to what they did. And God witnessed it and others witnessed their faith. And you know what today? God is witnessing what we do and others are witnessing what we do. The Bible said we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Whether those are looking down from heaven or not, hey, you decide, amen. But somebody's watching our lives. Let us lay aside every weight. They think it's holding you back. And the sin which does so easily beset you. 
beset us. You've got a besetting sin, that thing that you struggle with often. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How do you do that? Looking unto Jesus. If you're going to overcome the besetting sins, if you're going to lay aside the weights, if you're going to run with patience, you've got to keep your focus on the finish line, on the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and thank God is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You've got to keep your focus on the Lord. Amen. There's so many distractions in this world and so many things that's trying to rock us from being practical in our lives. Our focus should be clear. It should be based on the canon of the scriptures and it should be centered on Christ. Amen. When it comes to the practical faith of Moses, look back in Hebrews 11, he kept his focus. Not only did he keep his focus, but number two in verse 28, he never got over his salvation. You say, Moses wasn't saved like you and I. I said he never got over his salvation. Do you know the word salvation doesn't mean being born again in the church age? Amen. We ain't going to get into the doctrine. He got into it this morning, but he never got over his salvation. You know what salvation is? It's preservation from destruction, danger, or great calamity. Do you know there was destruction coming to the children of Israel? Hey, Pharaoh was breathing down their neck, wanted to destroy God's chosen people. Hey, but the salvation of the Lord showed up. And you know what, Moses? He never got over his salvation. Look in verse 28. 28, the Bible says this. Hey, Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. He never got over how God delivered him. Matter of fact, the children of Israel were to never get over the Passover. How God came by and miraculously delivered delivered them from the destruction of Pharaoh's army. Look in Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter 12. He never got over his salvation. Do you know what? If you're going to be practical in your life, you've got to keep your focus, but you can't never get over your salvation. Hey, there's, some, there's six individuals getting baptized tonight. Glory be to God. You know what I'd say to those six individuals? Never get over the fact that God saved your soul. It wasn't church membership. It wasn't your good works. It surely ain't going to be that water and that baptistry. It is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that saved your soul. And don't never get over the fact that God saved you. We as God's people should never get over the blessings of being a child of God, how God reached down in a horrible pit and pulled us up out of that pit, set our feet on a solid rock, and established our goings. Amen. Amen. If you're going to be practical in your life, you've got to keep your focus on the Lord, but you can't get over the fact of being saved. I don't know how you really can, amen, unless you lose your mind. How you get over something so glorious? How could they get over something so glorious that happened in their life? Look at here. Look in Exodus 12. Look in, uh, look in verse 3. Exodus 12, 3. Look at this. Look at this great example. He says, Speak ye unto all the congregation. This is Moses being commanded by the Lord what to tell the children of Israel. Over 400 years of bondage to Pharaoh and his people. God's came down there and he's used Moses to show all these plagues to e Egypt to try to get his people out. But, they, the, but it wasn't the frogs that got them out. It wasn't the lice that got them out. It wasn't the death of the cattle that got them out. It was the blood on the doorpost that got them out. Amen. Look in verse 3. Speaking to all the congregation of Israel saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take of them a, every man a lamb. You see that? A lamb, according to the house of their father, a lamb for an house. Verse 4, and if the household be too little for the lamb. Pay, pay attention to how the Holy Ghost does this thing. He said you take a lamb, but if the house be little for the lamb. Look what he says here. Let him and his neighbor next into his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to the eating shall make your count for the lamb. But look in verse 5. Your lamb. Hey, man, hey, thank God Jesus Christ was a lamb. Thank God he was the lamb that taken away the sins of the world. But thank God I can say tonight, this morning, he is my lamb. Amen. Hey, yes, he was a lamb for the world. He was the lamb of God which taken away the sins of the world. But thank God he's my lamb. Amen. And if you're saved, he's your lamb. Amen. Don't get over the fact that God saved your soul. Hey, because there's going to be things when you get out in this old world. It's going to rock you. Like the brother said this morning, you might have to look back and say, man, I know I'm saved because that's what God said. 
hey don't you ever lose focus what God has shown you in the light when it gets dark but don't you ever get over the fact of being born again when the devil gets you to doubt whether you're saved man he's going to take you down as low as he can because then you get this thought well if I ain't saved then what's it really matter by the way, let me just hit this just while I'm here. That's why the, the work salvation and, 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 and the, the, the false uh, doctrine of Arminianism that you can be saved and lost and saved and lost and saved and lost. If there, on top of all the other things that's demonic about it, this is one demonic thing about it. This is how the devil uses people that are saved to doubt whether they are saved because people preach that garbage and it causes people to go back to the world thinking, well, if I was never saved, what does it really matter anyhow? If I've lost it, why should I keep going on when you realize God saved you and you can't lose it, amen? It gives you something to keep going on, amen. It's a damnable heresy that causes people to go back to the world. He said, well, now, we, you know what's amazing about that crowd? They think they're preaching in a way that I'm going to make them do right. You can't make nobody do right. It's the love of God that constraineth us. But it's when it gets deep down in your soul that I know God saved me and what God doeth, he doeth forever. I'm internally grateful back to what he done for me and the least I can do is try to give him my best. But when the devil can come to you and say, well, you lost it now, you know what they do? They go back to the world because so, what's it matter? Now I'm lost. Why should I keep serving the Lord? I don't even know the Lord no more. Now I'm going to hell. I've lost what I did have. It's of the devil, amen. You can't lose focus on what God done. That's why, you know, in practical truth, that's what God's showing the children of Israel here. Hey, you know why they would have that Passover every year? And I know what they did with the sacrifice, and I know the works and salvation in tune with the Old Testament, but I'm talking about a practical truth that is written for our admonition and our learning, and it might exhort us to go on for the Lord. It was the blood that was on the two doorposts, and it was on the lintel. It was the type of the two thieves beside Jesus, and him being at the top, amen, and they were to remember that blood every year as the Passover over lamb that took away their sins that delivered them from the destruction hey don't get over how God saved your soul amen, amen. Right. Jesus Christ died once amen. we're saved forever amen. amen if it's going to get practical you can't forget what God done for you amen. don't you ever get over the salvation of the Lord amen. faith rests under the blood of my lamb amen, amen. and if he's, you're saved he's your lamb because what did God say to the children of Israel? You know how it works in Hebrews, uh, Exodus 12. He said, you tell them. He said, you take that hyssop and you dip it in that blood of that lamb, which was a lamb, which became your lamb, and you take your blood of your lamb and you dip that blood in that, on that hyssop and you sprinkle it on those two lentil posts and, pre and, and sprinkle it on the top, amen, of the lentil and the two side posts of the door, typifying Jesus Christ being the door to heaven. There's so many types there, you can't miss it, amen. How Jesus Christ is the only way away from the death angel that's coming or passing by. And the Bible said when the death angel came by, if the blood wasn't on the door, hey, every firstborn was going to die. But thank God when they had sprinkled the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel, and when the death angel came by, he said, there's the blood, I can't enter in. And thank God the devil might come by. Thank God the world might tell me I ain't saved, but I I can say today the blood is applied and death and hell will never come my way. Don't get over the fact that God saved your soul. Hey, 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 if you're not saved today, it's only going to be the blood that's going to save you. And if you're saved, don't let the devil rock you from it. If you've not been where you ought to be, get on an altar and say, God, you shed your blood for me, and I know I'm saved. Forgive me for the way I've been living. Help me to get back up and go forward for you. I want my life that's personal to be practical so the world can see it. Amen. How you do it, you got to keep your focus. You can't get over the fact that God's salvation for your soul. He said, look, look back in Hebrews we can go on with Exodus 12. It's a great chapter there. Hebrews chapter 12, 11. Hebrews 11. It's amazing how the perennial faith became personal faith, which became practical. And it was practical because, verse 27, he kept his focus. For he endured as seeing him who was invisible. He believed what he could see. When it became 
uh, the fact of him never getting over his salvation, verse 28, look at how this says, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. He believed what he couldn't see. He couldn't see the death angel coming, but he came. Amen. But he believed what he couldn't see. He moved by the vision of the invisible. He believed what he could see, but he believed what he couldn't see. If you walk by faith, you got to put faith in what God has shown you, and you got to believe what you cannot see. Amen. You know what? I can't see the blood applied to my soul, but thank God I know it's there. Amen. 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 I know, I know. I am fully persuaded that God has saved my soul. It's his salvation. He kept his focus. He never got over his salvation. But number three, I don't want you to miss this. When it comes to the practical faith of Moses, he kept going forward no matter how hard it got. Do you know what you can rest assured of? It ain't going to be easy. That's a lie of the devil to tell you this thing's going to be easy. Amen. You know what? Thank God for salvation It is of the Lord. That's the easy part, man. God saved me. I didn't save myself. But if I'm going to be practical and live it for the Lord, yea, and all that will live God in Christ, Jesus shall suffer persecution. you got to keep your focus on the Lord. You can't get over your salvation, but you got to keep going when it gets hard. Well, what you going to do when your spouse don't like it? What you going to do when your children go wayward? What you going to do when your preacher don't treat you right? What you going to do when the Sunday school teacher, teacher says something you don't like? What you going to do when one of the brothers or sisters in the church should run their mouth about you? Hey, hey, mama, what you going to do when one of them says something about your youngins? I mean, you hang around long enough, every one of these things is going to happen. Hey, man, Moses, you going to go out there and trust the Lord? Yeah, I'm going to trust the Lord. What are you going to do when it gets hard, son? What are you going to do when you go out there and say, hey, God has called me to deliver you, and they say, who are you? And he steps out and slays an Egyptian and kind of gets some proof and let the world know he's on their side. God's people know he's on their side, and they look at him and said, who are you? You going to tell me what to do when I know what you have done? Come on, bro. That's what they looked at him and said, hey, you going to tell us what to do when you do I seen you do that, what ain't right? What you going to do when somebody points the finger at you and say, you going to tell me what to do and look how you live? You think it's going to get easy? You got to endure when it's hard, man. You got to believe what you can see. You got to believe what you can't see. But you got to believe what you think you saw. <laughs> he believed what he couldn't believe he saw. I can't believe I saw that. Hey, man, look in verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptian shade to do were drown. He believed what he saw. He trusted the invisible. He believed what he couldn't see, but then he believed what he couldn't believe he saw. Amen. I mean, you step through the Red Sea, and the water's up on both sides. I ain't sure I'm seeing this. You got to believe what you can't even believe you saw. <laughs> you, 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 you know what I'm talking about, Amen. That's kind of like that old man over there by the sun, amen, that's casting himself in the fire, and amen, torment himself every day. And Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Yeah. You got to believe what I can't believe I'm seeing, amen. You mean you can use me? You got to believe what you can't believe you saw. Look back in Exodus 14. Look at this. He kept going forward no matter how hard it got. Amen, it got hard. Man, it, it'll get hard. Amen, this thing ain't easy. Christianity ain't for wimps. Amen. Amen. You got to keep going. It's going to get rough. You say, preacher, it ain't rough to me. Well, you hold on. You hold on. It's real good right now when everybody loves your baby. I mean, how can you not love my grandson? Sweet and them cheeks and, man, just innocent. How can you not love that? But you get him out there and he bites somebody else's youngin' in the nursery. We got trouble. Your youngin bit my youngin. And then they ain't biting him and you're mad about them biting him. Now they're biting their back. Back biting. Now they're sharing gossip about one another. 
You thought it was bad when they were biting in the nursery, man. You ain't, you can't run with the footman. What you gonna do when the horsemen come? The, the footman's in the nursery, man. The horsemen are out there in the teenage years. When the hormones are going crazy and everybody's acting like they lost their mind. And you trying to raise a teenager. What you gonna do then? Well, I know what I'm gonna do. I, I, we'll just go somewhere else. We'll go where, you know, I don't care where you go. There's going to be trouble everywhere. There's going to be somebody that's going to run their mouth always. Listen, 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 listen. That don't make it right. And if you run your mouth, get right about it. But listen, you got to make up your mind. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. God said, Moses, I've called you for this. I put you here for this. Now, what you going to do when it gets rough? Hey, man, you got to keep going no matter how hard it gets. Hey, look in Exodus 14. They delivered out. The blood's been on the doorpost. Pharaoh said, get out and go. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. It didn't take very long to realize this thing ain't a cakewalk. When the blood was shed and put on the doorpost and they were shouting the victory, when they woke up the next day and everybody was alive and they were getting out of there and leaving Egypt and leaving bondage, they were happy. Matter of fact, I think the phrase goes out that they went out with a high hand. But it went long when that high hand became a low spirit. Amen. They went out triumphant, but it wasn't long. They wondered, what have we got ourselves into? You know why I believe God don't show you all the troubles in Christianity? Because some people just wouldn't get saved if you saw all the troubles. It's sometimes rough, man. Sometimes it's hard. But they went out, and then they saw Pharaoh coming, and they're thinking, man, I don't know if we made the right choice. I don't know if God sent me to that church or not. I thought it was going to be easier than this. I thought everybody was going to love me like they loved me when they would court me for three months to get me to join. <laughs> You're going to find out, man, that court don't last long. What you got the first three months was our best behavior. That's what I tell them about courting. When these girls and boys start courting, what you getting in the courting ages is the best they ever going to be. And if they are bad then, you better put them down the road because it ain't getting better. For some reason, we think when I get them, you ain't changing them. This is the honeymoon. But Pharaoh's coming. And he's breathing down your neck. It's going to get hard. Hey, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Hey, hey, went too long ago. Brother James, man, been a great assistant, man, great Sunday school teacher helping out with the adult class. Went long ago. We were praying, man, he's about to lose his eyesight. What are you going to do, man? This thing ain't easy. Miss Rhonda's got cataract surgery this week. and saying, man, she might lose it. What are you going to do when it gets hard? What are you going to do? We got individuals in here when you had to like, walk down that old dirt road trail and put a loved one in a box and drop them down in the dirt. It ain't easy, man. What are you going to do when that child says, I don't want to go to church no more. I don't want to serve God no more. What are you going to do when it gets hard like that? There's examples all in this church where it's been hard, but you kept going on because you want to practice what God gave you. Amen. Nobody said it was easy. And Pharaoh's breathing down your neck. And you're wondering if you made the right choice. And to top it all off, look in verse 11. And they said unto Moses, Behold, there were no graves in Egypt. Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is, it not, is, is, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness? I mean, here's Moses. How you going to make it, son? And you're out there and you say, God told me to deliver him. And he stepped out, brother, and started practicing it. Yeah. And he went out on the backside of that desert, married to that girl down there and had those youngins. And God showed up at that burning bush and said, son, I ain't done. Would you get up? Let's go. And he goes down there and he shows the plagues to Pharaoh and Pharaoh makes it harder on everybody else. And while he's making it harder on everybody else, they're running their mouth back to Moses and Moses is having to deal with the, the thoughts and the, and the accusations and the mouth being run about him. But he keeps going. Amen. 
And the blood's put on the post, and they're out away from Pharaoh, and they're thinking, man, I got a little relief. And then here comes Pharaoh again. And the crowd gets to looking at the dust. And then they begin to look at that man, Moses. Didn't we tell you to leave us out there to die? Why'd you bring us out in the wilderness to die? What are you going to do when that wife looks at you and says, this is what we want, we signed up for? This is what we called of the Lord to do? Amen. What you going to do, youngest, when all the other teenagers start going the way of the world and start persecuting you? They're going to run their mouth. What you going to do, man? I'm in for God is what I'm in for. Amen. If it's going to be practical, you got to keep going when it gets hard. Somebody said it's going to be easy, but you made a commitment to God. Don't you lose your focus. Don't you get over the fact that you're a child of God, and don't you quit no matter how hard it gets. you got to believe what you can't believe you see. How can you, you might put yourself in Moses' shoes. He had to look twice, make sure that was a bush that was on fire that wasn't consumed. Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? And then the Lord speaks to him, he shows him. And he goes down there and he starts giving those plagues down to Pharaoh and the Egyptians do some of them, you know. You believe what I'm seeing? And then the crowd starts looking at him and saying, hey man, now he's made us make brick without mortar and look what you've done. You believe they treat me like this and all I'm doing is trying to do what God told me to do? This is what I get for serving the Lord? Hell at the home and hell with my youngest and hell at the church? This is what I get for doing right? Don't tell me you don't get like that sometimes. This is what I get in turn. All I'm trying to do is what God called me to do. And you get out there and they said, hey, why didn't you leave us in Egypt? You got to press on. What are you going to do? What do you do, Adrian? And they say, you got leukemia. What do you do? And then on top of leukemia, you get, a, you get to hurt and then you go to the hospital and think, man, something's got worse. What do you do when it's bad news after bad news? What do you do when it seems to be crumbling out from under you? You got to keep pressing on, amen. Because God knows what he's doing. We don't know what's going on. What did Moses do? Look in verse 13. The Bible said this. The Bible said, And Moses said unto them, uh, unto the people, excuse me, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he have showed to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever, amen. Stand still and watch God work, amen. You know what you got to do? You got to draw a line and say, here I stand. He said over in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6 about the warrior fight of the child of God. When you've done all to stand, stand therefore. And withstand. And keep standing, amen. Because God's going to come through. When you can't believe what you see. When you're trying to wrap your mind around it. God's faithful. Moses says, stand right here, boys. You know, what's you know why a lot of God's people miss the miracle? They won't stand still long enough. Amen. We run. But the truth be told, same as with them, what do we got to run? Water here, mountains here, Pharaoh here. It's kind of about like in the New Testament over there when the, when the crowd looked at Jesus and said, would you also go away? They said, where do we have to go? Listen, listen, listen. As a child of God, where do we got to go? If the world would have been good enough, I'd have never left it. That's right. Amen. If the drugs would have done it, I'd have kept doing them. If the hellious lifestyle would have been satisfying, I'd have kept living that way. But it wasn't satisfying. It couldn't fill the longing of my soul. God is the best thing's ever happened to me. And I'm going to stand and trust the Lord. And watch him through his salvation. And the Lord walks through. And the water stand up and he can't. I can't believe what I'm seeing. I don't know how it's working. Might not be a big thing to you. I was, make, I was talking about my truck the other day not running. I'll tell you about my truck broke down. He said, that's a little thing. Yeah, it's a little thing to you. But man, that thing about drive me nuts. My truck was a good truck. I thought it was a good truck. And it wasn't cranked the other Sunday. And it had been raining for days like Noah's flood, and I ain't going to never get to work on it. And I'm having to live and thinking, man, I... Can't work on my truck. And I got a break the other day, and the sun came out, and I changed the starter on it. And I, I carried that starter over there to Advance Auto. God help Advance Auto people. They try to do the best they can. And they set it up on that machine, and 
they really didn't even know how to set it up on the machine to check it. And so then they set it up on there, and it ran. And I heard, you ever worked on a car that started just like wild up? And I think, ain't wrong with this starter. And she said, it's got a code on it. I said, what's the code? She said, it's this. I said, what's that mean? She said, I don't know. But it's got to be bad. I said, but it, it looks like it's good. She said, but it's got to be bad. And I thought, well, maybe it is bad. It won't crank. I said, well, if I buy this starter and it put it on my truck and don't work, can I bring it back and get my car back? She said, no, you can't do that. So I was in for the long haul, so I gave him my 130, 40 bucks and bought the starter and went home and put it on it, done the same thing. <laughs> and I thought, I knew there wasn't nothing wrong with that starter. After a few calming down, I thought, what's wrong with it? And I checked the voltage on the battery, and it's 12.4 volts. And I thought, man, ain't nothing wrong with the battery. And I've asked every mechanic in the world I know about what's going on and my knowledge, and I couldn't figure it out, and it still wasn't crank. So we got out the other day. It was nice again. I put Aaron up under the, under the car with the, with, the, with the voltmeter on the starter. I said, what is it? He said, it's 12.4 volts. I said, it's good. I said, Luke, turn the key. Luke went, turn, it clinked. He said, it dropped down to six volts. Well, that ain't enough volts to turn the motor. So there's got to be something that ain't going to send the volts down there. What do you do? And I said, how could that be? I didn't check all the grounds and checked everything. And I said, it's going to work. What the world has this got to do with Pharaoh? I don't know. <laughs> I am chasing the rabbit, amen. <laughs> it's not, you're not supposed to do that when you preach. Don't chase rabbits. But I'm chasing them. And I'm, I'm going to get him. I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> but Luke gets in there and he holds the thing over. I mean, you don't hold it over. And that thing, ding, like Aaron's like, ah, I'm under the truck. <laughs> like he's going to die up under there. Man, you got your arm? Oh, yeah, still good. I said, and then it crunk up. I didn't bought a $150 starter, a $100 battery. But I, kept, I was smart on the battery. I kept my receipt. That thing's going back to Walmart. <laughs> Because Walmart takes back anything. Amen. But you know what I was wondering? What, is, what could it be? You ever get like that and you're thinking, it's just driving you nuts? All you're doing is do serve the Lord. Now you call it, well, all won't run. All you're trying to do, do right. Now this is breaking. This is tearing up. You know what? God's faithful. Amen. And when that thing crunk, I was seeing what I couldn't believe I saw. <laughs> and my truck's in the parking lot today. I drove to church. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. People was breathing down his neck. You got to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and go forward. Through faith, you got to walk through the impossible. You know what's amazing about Moses? Look back at this in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Practical faith. You know God's practical. And he wants us to be practical. You got to keep your focus. You can't get over the fact that God saved you. And you got to keep going no matter how hard it gets. In verse 27, the Bible said, by faith he forsook Egypt. You know what God gave him? God gave him victory over the world. Verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest, the destroy, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. God gave him victory over the flesh. Death. Verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea. As by dry land, which the Egyptians are saved to do were drown. God gave him victory over the devil. Pharaoh was a type. Do you know what God will do? God will give you victory. Titus chapter 2. Let me read you this and I'll quit here. Titus 2. God will give you victory. It was practical. 2.11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to all men. Teaching us, verse 12 of Titus 2, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority that no man despise thee. You know what God's looking for? Some people that had perennial faith in their life that one day became personal to them, which led to it being practical in their lives. I'm just going to live for the Lord. Amen. Just by the grace of God, going to keep my focus on Him. I'm going to keep pressing on when I don't see a way. When it gets hard, I'm going to keep putting one foot in front of another. 
I'm going to never get over the fact that God saved me and he's the best thing that ever happened in my life and he is worthy of my service. Is your faith practical? Yeah, there's probably, you know, really not too bad of a thing because some people ain't been saved that long and it's just kind of personal to you. You got it. But there needs to come a time when your life grows up, you grow up a little bit in the faith and it becomes practical. Maybe we got some around here that need a little bit of perennial faith to trust the Lord to get a hold of those children, to stick with the stuff until God gets a hold of them. Let's just serve the Lord. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you need to come today. The Bible says in Psalms 46 and verse 10, Be still and know that I am God.